for the first time, the money that I've invested and has grown on top of itself is making more money than I make now. And that's, I think that's a goal that a lot of people aspire to, especially to become financially independent, is the money that I have now is working harder than I am. Who's crazy enough to bet against Warren Buffett? You're about to find out. You're in the right place, folks, because this is where the money is. Welcome to the show. I'm Matt Kopenheffer. This here is David Hansen. David, before the show started, we were talking about Jimmy Fallon. Again. And The Tonight Show. Again, again. This is, this is a popular topic. Uh, almost as popular as Rob Ford jokes are on Jimmy Fallon's show. I was saying, I'd like to do, I'd like to do that job. I'd Good like luck. to do that job. I'd like to, I'd like to just go on there. The, the one thing that I couldn't, do, that, that I'm sure that I couldn't do is be as funny as him on that monologue. So I'm thinking maybe on this show, We'll start with a monologue. Yeah, we're gonna start beginning this show with a monologue. We've so got like a some, curtain over here. We could pull it around. So, you could walk out yeah, of that. So I can get some get some practice. I don't think they're scouting us for next time. I'm pretty sure. I don't know. I'm pretty sure they are. I don't know if you have it. I'm sorry. But but wait. I like but, you here. I like you at this. I but that's why I need to start doing the monologue so I can get the practice. Real. Gotta wear a suit too. Can I wear a bow tie still? Yeah, it could be your thing. Oh okay. I can wear a suit, but I can also wear a bow tie. Correct. All right, let's get to the first headline. Let's get to the real stuff here. First headline of the day, this comes from the FT. It says, New York Fed finds big banks enjoy taxpayer subsidy. So this is back to the too big to fail banks. There is actually, this is actually a group of studies that was uh, performed by the New York Federal Reserve. They were looking at the, the size and complexity of the big banks and the, the fallout, basically the good and the bad of all of that. <clears throat> and one of the things that they found is that there is a funding advantage. There's lower cost for borrowing for bigger banks. Mm -hmm. And they've attributed this to the government being in a position to, to step in and save the banks when they're about to fail. Banks bigger than other smaller banks, not right. just everyone. Right, the biggest banks. The biggest banks. Well, they're looking at this and saying, does this say that we haven't fixed too big to fail? Because there's clearly, the market thinks that banks are too big to fail. But they said this data was up until 2009. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't really take into account any Isn't changes. Since, I think it's since 2009. No, it was up it, until up, up two, okay. 2009. So it doesn't take into, into effect anything the government has done or regulators have done to mm -hmm. kind of hopefully make that less. Do you think the perception has changed? Do you think anybody thinks now that the government wouldn't step in? If there was a crisis today, would the government step in and save Bank of America? I think it would probably depend on the crisis. If it was similar to the one we had, where it was everyone connected, I think they would step in. Is everybody not connected now? But if it was a single company <laughs> that had its own problems, I think you could probably say it's more likely they could wind it down. But that's, but that's the whole problem, isn't it? If, if Bank of America had problems, it's still interconnected with everybody. If J.P. Morgan had problems, it's still interconnected with everybody. Those ties, that's not going away. True. I, you know, one, one of the things that they, that they said, they actually tried to suss out whether this was not just a large company thing, so they compared this to non-bank financial companies as well, and they compared it to non-financial companies. So the big companies versus the small companies and the discount they get on selling their bonds. And they found that for the biggest banks, there's more of a discount. Mm -hmm. So that that's pretty strong. At the same time, I mean, there's an argument that maybe bondholders view the banking industry as different. And they're legit, they see legitimately less risk in a larger, more diversified mm -hmm bank versus, say, a larger, more diversified industrial conglomerate. Right. Um, but I, 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 don't think, I don't think there needs to be any serious argument that there is some funding advantage in there from the, the, the government too big to fail. So you don't backstop. need to have that? No, no, I, I'm, saying, I'm, I'm saying... There's no question that there is. I, right. I don't think that there's any question that there is some advantage to that. There's got to be. As equity investors, should we really care? Kind of. I mean, you can make the argument that it affects profits if they can borrow less. It's advantageous to equity holders. But at the end of the day, do we really care? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I, th I think yes. And, and I think both from a positive perspective and a negative perspective. As a positive, if a bank can borrow, if a big bank can borrow at a lower cost, that's a good thing. If you're an investor, you don't look at this and say, oh, that's not. You say, yeah, that's great. Yeah. Bank can borrow. But 
the other side to it, and this is, this is today, this is post-2009 as opposed to pre-2009, today there's so much more scrutiny, there's so much more oversight, the bigger banks have been more of a target for lawsuits in the post-crisis era than the smaller banks. So there's a lot of bad that's come with that yeah. size as well. So and, and one of the things you could away. point to is, is multiples in terms of price-to-book multiples, mm -hmm. so much more depressed than the smaller regional banks. So you could say that's impacting investors as well. Right, and that's a, a, a perception thing as much as anything else. Second headline. Second headline. Market Watch. Here's the big one. This is this from is, Market Watch. This is not our second headline. We don't have our second headline. Well, the second headline was about uh, Market Watch and... The headline is why I'm betting against Warren Buffett. There you go. You? Are you right? Oh, there we go. No, 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 it's the headline. I know, I'm just joking. It was by oh, Nicholas... Oh, that was a funny joke. It was Good by job. Nicholas Maybe Vardy. You should be on The Tonight Show with jokes oh, like God. that. <laughs> this is by Nicholas Vardy. Why I'm betting against Warren Buffett. He's not shorting Berkshire Hathaway, but he's... Literally betting. He's literally betting against... Literally betting. Someone else. We don't have his name. But he thinks, Nicholas Vardy thinks, small cap stocks will outperform Berkshire Hathaway over the next 10 years. As Some, tracked by the Russell 2000 index. Yes. And someone else is taking the other side saying, no, I think Berkshire will outperform small caps. What do you think? I, or do you not really have an opinion? I don't want to put you on the spot. If I, don't, you I, don't, I don't bet on this kind of thing. Um, the, what, what I would say is that I don't think it's as clear as Vardy thinks it is. Um, it's quite possible that small caps could continue to outperform large caps because I think that's a lot of his, that, that sounds like the large part of his thesis here. Yeah. Not necessarily that it's a Berkshire Hathaway thing, and he actually says that in the article. This isn't a judgment on Berkshire Hathaway per se. It's this idea that small caps tend to perform, out outperform large caps. And we've seen academic research that uh, in the past that has shown that small caps tend to have an outperformance advantage. However, the problem is, is that over shorter time spans than like forever, and that can include 10 year time spans, large caps can outperform small caps. And so if we look back from uh, 1990, uh, 1990 to 2000, that decade range, large caps handily outperform small caps. Mm -hmm. And then when we look at 2000 to today, small caps have handily outperformed large caps. Which is what he and, highlighted. Right, yeah. and it, but the, the problem there is that this is sort of a cyclical thing, the large cap versus small cap outperformance. And when you look at the valuations of small caps versus large caps, you, you see, you, we can see that small caps are much more highly valued right now mm -hmm. than large caps. And the exact opposite true, was true in 2000. Mm -hmm. So you've got a runway, potentially, for large caps to outperform small caps going forward. There's a, there's a little bit of a chorus around Berkshire Hathaway right now saying it's a little too big, it failed to grow its book value uh, at a greater rate than the S&P over the last five years. That's somewhat of a narrative right now. But Buffett highlights, you have to look at this across cycles. The past five years have been a great bull market for the S&P. And over the next 10 years, we probably will have somewhat of another cycle, whether it be a recession, mm. possible, or just kind of a bear market, if you will. So you have to look at what will Berkshire Hathaway do over that time period. And I would feel better betting on Berkshire rather than small if, if I had If I had to take one side of this or the other, I would take Berkshire Hathaway over the Russell 2000. I would also take, say, the Dow as a measure of, of large caps over the Russell 2000. Uh, because I think, and, and to be fair, I've thought this for years because I've, I've looked at the outperformance of small caps going back a few years now. I've said this for years that I think there will come a point where we'll see large caps start to outperform small caps. So I haven't been right so far on that, or I haven't been, the market hasn't proved that out. Um, but I would take large caps and Berkshire Hathaway over the Russell. Well, and again, you don't have to do things independently. As investors, you can do both. You can invest in small caps and large caps. So Really? You can't do that. That's wonderful. You're not limited to just one. The market is such a wonderful place. Third headline. Now we're going to Bloomberg. Bloomberg says Bitcoin is property. Well, actually, the IRS said this. Bitcoin is property, not currency, in tax system, colon, IRS. <laughs> Got to get the colon in there, Bloomberg. Love the colons. So it's pretty simple. The, the, the headline says it all. The, the IRS has determined that as opposed to a currency, Bitcoin is property. Mm -hmm. And one of the most notable aspects of this is that it's taxable, the, the capital gains on Bitcoin are taxable. So uh, I think in the Bloomberg article, this might have been, they, they used the example that if you buy a Bitcoin for $1 and you use that Bitcoin after bit, the price of Bitcoin goes up to buy a $2 coffee, 
then you have to pay capital gains on the dollar mm -hmm. that, you, uh, that you made there. So I think the long-term capital gains rate is 24%. Mm -hmm. so, um, so let's say- you, Well, for some people, you held high that, end. Well, no, no, long-term capital gains. I think that's, that's a flat, isn't it? No. Oh, okay. Well, it depends well, on how much you make. Let's yeah. just say it's 24%. For, so if you, you've got the long-term capital gains rate there, your cup of cof coffee just cost you uh, it's an extra quarter or so. Right. right. So, not which, good news. Which may sound insane. You're gonna be like, oh my gosh, am I gonna have to think about capital gains every time I buy something with my Bitcoin? Yes. Kind of. Yes. But the software behind most Bitcoin wallets or the apps that you're gonna be using would track this and be able to send you basically a statement. Sure. You're, you're not gonna have to like well, pull no, out no, no. a you, you don't have to go and do the calculations like, How much do I owe now? Right, but when, but when you're going to purchase anything with Bitcoin, you have to take into account how much extra is this gonna cost me because I'm cashing in these capital gains? Yes. Now, if you're truly using it as a currency, if you believe this whole currency thing and you're using it as a currency, which is really tough right now because you can't buy many things with Bitcoin, uh, you'd have to go out there and you have to think about, uh, or, or I'm, I'm sorry, if, if you're using it constantly as a currency, you're probably not holding it long enough yeah. to see considerable capital gains. And since the price fluctuates so much, if you buy it and the price goes down, you're gonna have offsets to the mm -hmm. capital gains you get elsewhere. So maybe it all offsets for you if you actually are transacting in Bitcoin constantly. Makes my head hurt. It does a little bit. You know, you, know who, you know who is probably one of the most unhappy parties with this decision? Who? Winklevoss twins. Why? Sitting on massive capital gains. Oh, yes. Massive capital gains. I wouldn't want to know the tax bill that they are now looking at from this decision. Significant. A lot of coffee, a lot, lot, lot of coffee, a lot of ibuprofen yes. in the uh, Winklevoss household after that one. Moving on to the focus for today, doing a little bit of a, an education segment here, getting exciting. Get excited. Let's go to because school. Because we're getting excited. Uh, compensation discussion and analysis. I'm not excited anymore. No, <laughs> this is exciting, I promise you. This is a section of the proxy statement. So every year a company issues a proxy statement. This invites, cordially invites shareholders to the annual public, uh, the annual meeting. And it also gives details of a lot of the, the board of directors, uh, the management team, and a lot of the compensation. So all of the compensation practices, how much executives are getting paid. But let's start here. Daniel Loeb uh, and his hedge fund have been in the news recently uh, going, going against Sotheby's. So not happy with management practices at Sotheby's. Late last year, they sent a letter to Sotheby's. How would you describe Sotheby's business in one sentence? Auction house? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. High-end auction house. All right. Very in case fan anyone didn't know. Very fancy stuff. Yeah. There's actually a Duke mentioned in in Sotheby's proxy statement, Very cool. a Duke. That is, that's really cool. It's a reason to buy right you're, there. You're, you're really high end when you're talking about a Duke yes. in your proxy statement. And I mean, it's not like, it's not like a guy with Duke as his last name. Mm -hmm. This is a Duke of something who uh, goes yeah. by Duke of. Exactly, I cool. I what it was, Duke of Winchester, or something like that. Anyway, letter to Sotheby's board at the end of last year from Loeb. Here's, here's a section of that letter. In sharp contrast to your limited stock holdings, is a generous package of cash pay perquisites and other compensation. We see little evidence justifying your 2012 total compensation of 6.3 million in both salary and PSU awards, that's performance share uh, unit awards, mm -hmm. valued at over 4 million, seemingly based on a mysterious target not disclosed in any of the company's public filings. Your compensation award compares quite favorably to companies offered as peers to your own proxy statement, 3.9 million to the CEO of Nordstrom, 6.1 million to the CEO of Tiffany, both companies more than three times the size of Sotheby's, and yet Sotheby's has clearly underperformed these comparables. A review of the company's proxy statement reveals a perquisite pack package that, that invokes the long gone era of imperial CEOs. I love that. A car allowance, coverage of tax planning costs, and reimbursement for membership fees and dues to elite country clubs. So you read that letter and the thought might be, well, this is, this is hedge funds doing the hedge fund thing. They've gone and they've done all this investigative research. Mm -hmm. They figured all these things out. Not so much. It's all right there in the proxy statement. Go to page 51 of the most recent Sotheby's proxy statement and you'll get a detailing of how much compensation the executives received. Uh, if you go to a, the Appendix A of the 2012 proxy statement, you get that list of comparables. So these are the, the comparable companies that Sotheby's says it's basing its compensation practices on. 
And if you go to 30, the page 35 of the most recent proxy, you get that list of per, uh, perks mm -hmm. that the, the, the uh, executives are getting. And, and how do we find the proxy statement? We've talked about it before, a quick refresh. How do we get there? The way I usually get there is I go to the SEC's Edgar, mm -hmm. um, uh, Edgar filing system, and I look for the filing DEF space 14A. That's the proxy. Yeah. You can also go to the investor relations page for the company, True. and they usually have a listing of SEC filings. You look for that DEF 14A, and that's your proxy. Because why not? Why not just call a proxy? I mean, I, why I, do you got to have the code? So, so here's... You can find all of that in the proxy statement, but then he, Loeb, uh, I'll re-highlight this. We see little evidence justifying your 2012 total compensation in both salary and PSU awards, seemingly based on a mysterious target not disclosed in the company's public filings. That's where this compensation discussion and analysis gets into, because in the proxy statement, there's a whole section where the companies walk through, here's how we set the compensation. And if you think about the classic follow the money. That works very well with the proxy statement. You go in there, you figure out how these executives are compensated, what are the things that they're looking at in order to make their money, right? and you get a good sense of what they're going to be shooting for, what, what, what they're driven by. So as a, as a comparison case, I pulled up Markel's, uh, Markel, this specialty insurer, it's a favorite of the show here, pulled up their proxy statement, uh, went to their CDNA section, and here's what they say. This is about the stock awards, which is typically the largest part right. of any executive's compensation. Here's what they say. Awards to executive officers under the executive bonus plan, the 2012 Executive uh, Equity Incentive Compensation Plan, and the Omnibus Incentive Plan, lots of weird stuff going on there, have generally been subject to the achievement of pre-established performance goals. The principal performance measure used in the plans for 2013 was the same, growth in book value. In the case of all named executive officers except Mr. Albanese, the sole performance measure was the five-year average compounded growth in book value. For Mr. Albanese, 50% of his war awards was based on that measure, and 50% was based on a, a combined ratio performance and growth in gross written premiums. So right there, you have a very clear detailing of we're paying these executives, we're giving them bonuses, here's what we're looking at to get to those bonuses. So number one, when you see the bonuses that Tom Gaynor uh, is, is getting, for example, you know what that's driven by. And when you think about what are these executives trying to do at that company, they're guided by that. If they want to get paid, if they want to get the bonuses, they're guided by that. Very important to have numbers here, measurable goals. You talk about book value growth over a five-year period, not to pile on Sotheby's, but if you look at theirs, when it's describing their CEO pay, it's like, well, he really deepened relationships this year and really catered to our, our wealthy clients mm -hmm. that we really care about. I mean, how are you measuring that? What's the tangible metric that you're saying he was successful at doing that mm -hmm. better than what we thought he was going to do? What are the goals? I mean, it's completely arbitrary almost. So you want to have a number that they can really work towards. This isn't, this isn't the Tonight Show. Well, actually, that's a, that's a bad example because even the Tonight Show can be measured by television ratings. Exactly. Everybody can be measured. So not to pile on them, but it no, is No, 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 I think pretty, that's okay. It's pretty In this ridiculous. case, I think it's okay. I'd like to get my oh. country club fees reimbursed. That's pretty nice. You, you belong to a country club? No, but if I, if I got it oh, reimbursed, you do. I You would. do, I bet you do. Oh, country club, in Cape Cod, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cape, your Cape Cod country club. We have an email address. That email address is wtmi at fool.com. We love to get mail. We get mail almost every day. It's great. Makes yeah. me happy. Uh, the mail today is from Mark. Mark writes, Bank of Internet hasn't been talked about on your show in a while. What's going on with them? Shares were selling at around $102, and over the last week or so, they seem to have dropped back down to the mid-80s. Why did they drop? I haven't found an answer for that yet. They continue to put up good numbers. Is this a buying opportunity, or did someone scoop the froth off their shares? I like that visual. Uh, you know, one thing that I'll point out here right off the top, you were pitching the Indian bank, mm -hmm. HDFC, yesterday, and one of the things that I balked at was the valuation. The valuation was 3.8 times, it's tangible book value, right? 3.8 times. Book value. 3.8 times book value. So with this drop in price for Bank of Internet, it's gone from over four times book value to 3.8 times. Yes. So you've got both of these at essentially the same valuation now, what are you buying at that valuation? I'm not buying either yet. Well, I'm 
theoretically? Um, B of I is, is more attractive today, obviously more attractive today than it was two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, it traded at 4.8 times book value. Now it's at 3.8, still rich. And the reason why they were down, um, can't say totally this is the reason why, but there was a, a bearish, a short article that came out online that some of the arguments you could say were a little bit flimsy, but it still made somewhat of a good point. Referenced our show at a couple points. They did reference us. As, 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 as bulls on, I think it referenced us as bulls. They on clearly the haven't been faithful subscribers. Yeah. We haven't yeah. been super bullish on the company. <laughs> We've been interested in it, but not super bullish. So there was a short article that came out that I think knocked some confidence from the stock there. Mm -hmm. So sitting at 3.8, I think I would lean towards HDFC. Ooh. And one of the main reasons is the bank's been around for 20 years, and it's mm -hmm. run by the same guys who have been running it for 20 years, and they have, have a really good track record of being disciplined through cycles here, and they've had the bank in a nice place here. B of I hasn't been around that long. We don't have the same track record of really good performance. So at the same price, similar growth rates, I'm going to go with HDF, HDFC. Fact, fact is better valuation, better value for Bank of Internet shares today. I, I think when you when you look at that kind of valuation, when you think about 3.8 times book value, if not 4.8 times book value, when you look at the rest of the banking sector, you've got to have emotion and, and sentiment in your favor to maintain that kind of valuation in this market, I think. And to the extent that Bank of Internet takes a hit on that, that's going to affect the shares. I think I'd go with you. I think I'd be with HDFC uh, right now. I think I, I think I become somewhat interested, very interested in B of I if it was at 3.2 today. 3.2, all right. That's my, that's my spot. Write that 3.8, it's, I think it's, you could make the argument that it's reasonable today, but I'd be much more interested at 3.2. Game for today, We've got a little rankings, rankings action. Today, later today, this is a big day. Or is it tomorrow? Today, 20, uh, 25th, 26th. Tomorrow. 26th. Darn it. Tomorrow. we got to wait until tomorrow. Tomorrow, the capital, comprehensive capital analysis and review. Review. CCAR. Mm -hmm. I like the CCAR better. That's easy. Uh, CCAR comes out from the Federal Reserve. That's where the Federal Reserve takes a look not only at the results of the stress testing that we already kind of saw, but also the capital plans for companies, how much they want to give in uh, dividends, how much they want to do in buybacks, and say yay or nay for the banks that they're reviewing. We're taking a look at, in this rankings, the top five in terms of additional capital returned to shareholders as a percentage of book value. Say that again. Additional, additional <laughs> capital returned to shareholders as a percentage of book value. It sounds a little wonky, but basically all it is, it's additional dividends. So you take the dividends that they paid last year, uh, you take the additional that they're gonna pay this year after the CCAR, plus the amount that they're going to spend on buybacks. Yep. And then you do that as a percentage of book value to right-size it across all of these banks because some of them are very, very large. Yep. Others, Zions Bank Corp, for instance, not very large. So you right-size it that way. We're going to see who's going to be returning the most. David, what are your rankings? My number one is American Express. Then I got Wells Fargo, Discover, PNC, and U.S. Bank Corp. American Express, number one, because we're looking at this on just a book value basis, that big multiple that it trades at oh, kind of normalizes yeah, it out here. So point. American Express, I think, has a very, very good shot of being having the biggest percentage there. Wells Fargo, same kind of thing. When you take the multiple out of the equation, I think there's a lot of room for them to move up there. Discover's already come out with their increase. I think they asked for a 20% increase in dividend. Uh, uh -huh. So that should be a pretty Correct. substantial boost for them. And PNC, a big share buyback. PNC opportunity is there as, as well in terms of increasing that payout ratio. And U.S. Bancorp, I have it down there, but last year they paid out around 70% of their earnings, 30% in earnings, then 40% via buybacks. I don't know how much they can increase that. And they've already come out and said they like to keep a little cushion if they want to make acquisitions. So I have a number five. I think you have them ranked higher. Tell me why. USB? Yeah, let's see your rankings. I have USB number one. Look, the, the way I, I think it was smart to think about the, the multiples there uh, because you got a larger company with a larger multiple, you can, you can have a bigger impact there on, on returning capital. What I looked at was the was lower starting uh, capital ratios. Mm -hmm. so, so lower, lower capital held, so, so you have a smaller capital base on which to return uh, capital, but then capital ratios that held up 
over that severely adverse scenario that the Fed was measuring against. Okay. Uh, so, so you have basically the possibility to return a lot of capital against a smaller capital base and the, the, um, the safety of balance sheet to justify it. Right. So USB number one, Fifth Third Bank Court number two, uh, SunTrust number three, M&T number four, BB, BB&T number five. M&T may be a little questionable at number four because of the way their capital ratios changed over that uh, severely adverse scenario. But they're a strong enough bank that I think that they can make a solid argument for uh, doing a good return to shareholders. Okay. It's, it's, a, it's a risky list because banks like Fifth Third, SunTrust didn't hold up as well during the last financial crisis. I feel pretty good about U.S. Bank Corp, though. Maybe it won't shake out to be number one, but I think it will be way up there. All right, we'll see. Finishing off the day in the Twitter sphere, David, what's our first tweet? First tweet is from Steve Kovach. He says, King, that's, what is it, what's the actual name of the company? I don't know, I just know the Candy Crush thing. Candy Crush thing, King, getting, <laughs> candy crush King thing. getting crushed. It's gone public today. Last I saw it, it was down, what, 10%? It was down as much as I think 20%. Oh, I saw 10% last or, or maybe maybe I'm, maybe I mixed it up down 10% below $20 a share. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I don't know why. I, I, I can't think of a reason to buy this one. I like it. I mean, I don't like the you, company. I like the, everyone's like, these IPOs are scary. I like the IPOs. Uh, not, 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 IPOs. not for investing, but I think it's a good thing long term to have. <laughs> not for investing. This. Yeah. I like IPOs. It's a no. good thing for life. People <laughs> will think of new things and try to bring them public. All right, second tweet. This is from our own TMF breaking news. That's at TMF breaking. More than two years after Occupy Wall Street began, NYC police removed barricades from around the Wall Street bull. This is, this is great. I think this might actually have been a picture I took. Yes. This, this is a picture I took. It was really sad. It was really sad going and, and trying to take pictures of the Wall Street bull with those barricades around it. I mean, it's also the people around it. There's constantly people like- Symbolic? Bull. They're unleashing the bull? The bull market. <laughs> Tonight's show, where's... Watch this be the top of the market, then everyone's going to be like, that was the sign. That was, yeah. That they unleashed the bull and it was all downhill from Or there. maybe the market just takes off from here. Either way, it's going to be a sign. Either way, it's a sign. Yeah. Mark that down. Third tweet. This is from Luis Perez. He says, at TMF Financials, at E-Trade does have mobile deposit. I've never mailed a deposit. On the podcast, you said they didn't. You said they didn't, and we have a picture of the E-Trade hmm. mobile deposit app. Hmm. Are you just technologically dumb? No, I, I don't I don't know when I don't know when this was introduced. I've had E-Trade uh, E-Trade Bank for a while now and I've never never seen or heard about that. So I'll have to check it out. Got to update that app. You still use like a Razer phone over there. You got This is Are you kidding? This is an HTC, HTC One X. Is it One X? 10X? I don't know. It's an X. There's an X in it. It's, it's like a Zach Morris phone. Is Gotta that, update that app. Oh no no no! This is this is just the case. Okay. I drop my phone at least five times a day. Update the app. You don't have to mail your deposit. I don't have I don't have the app. So called you out. This is awkward. Did call me out. <laughs> that is just a little awkward. <laughs> Thanks for putting that in there. By the way, it put me on the spot. At TMF Financials, did you know Berkshire Hathaway monopoly is a thing? I didn't you know, know that. that. I, I didn't. I didn't. It doesn't surprise me. There's like a monopoly for everything. It's a hundred dollars, but to buy. Oh, you can buy. No, 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 you can't buy a B-share anymore for that much. Here's a confession. I don't like Monopoly. <laughs> Are you kidding me? What's I don't wrong know, with you? I don't know when I've ever played a full game of Monopoly. Are you American? I'd much rather play, like, Catchphrase or something. <laughs> Monopoly. Let's, Who needs it? let's go to the next tweet. That's just, that's depressing. Final tweet is from Ferret Rescue. Lots of, lots of gorgeous ferrets <laughs> looking for new homes. <laughs> All of our ferrets are neutered, microchipped, and vaccinated. Please retweet, Matt, when are you buying your ferret? So we can try to break the record wait, for the longest wait. time in your ferret in your pants. Do you, do you have to buy the ferret? It sounds like you can just adopt them here, right? I think so. There's a link it's there. It's a ferret rescue. It's in the UK, though. They ship the ferrets over. I, I, I wouldn't want to do that to a ferret. It's fine. It likes small places. It bur it's a burrowing animal. But that's a, loud, that's a loud airplane for a little ferret. That's true. Maybe there's a ferret rescue here in the U.S. If someone out there listening has a pet ferret, send us a picture of your ferret. You and your ferret. Yeah. We, we want listening to this podcast. We want <laughs> you hold your, up the you, podcast. And you and your pit ferret listening to the podcast. That would be awesome. That would be really awesome. That's a great note to end on. Cool. That's the show for today. Uh, you can tweet at us at TMF Financials, or if you want to listen to us on your way to work 
and not get in a car accident while you're watching the video, check us out on iTunes. Until tomorrow, I'm Matt Kopenheffer, and this is David the Ferret Hansen. People on the show may have interest in the stocks they talk about, and The Motley Fool may have formal recommendations for or against. Don't buy or sell stocks based solely on what you hear.